later that it was, uh, was available for uh, Churchill, uh, what's your weather today? Uh, you made no mention of uh, when it would be ready as far as the twin otter is concerned. The single otter, uh, he uh, said, uh, would probably be ready on the 22nd, but he wasn't exactly sure on, as far as uh, the single otter is concerned. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure, why not? How many loads do you figure we have to take out? <laughs> Four to six? We got, uh, at least, I'd say it's six. At least. In the Proterozoic uh, provinces, are mining geologists are likely to search for ores in the thick sedimentary sequences deposited on the margins of fold belts. Sediments like these contain Canada's major uranium ores, much of the world's iron ore, and the Rand gold deposits of South Africa, the richest in the world. An understanding of this fundamental difference between the Archean and Proterozoic is all important for successful exploitation of Precambrian mining potential. Possibly. Probably. Perhaps. Common words in any description of the Precambrian. It's impossible to be certain about this 88% of the Earth's history. The evidence is only fragmentary. In the Shield's older provinces, huge expanses have been planed almost smooth by billions of years of erosion. Where volcanoes or mountains may have stood, even their roots have disappeared. At the bottom of the Grand Canyon, between the Precambrian rocks and the next layer above, one half billion years of geological history are missing. Even where the old rocks remain, their nature has sometimes been altered drastically by heat and pressure so that they are difficult to interpret. The oldest known rocks were originally sedimentary. This means that even then there was water for erosion and seas in which sediment could settle, just as mud and silt do today at the mouths of rivers and in the ocean. This process of erosion and sedimentation continued throughout the Precambrian. And one group of sedimentary deposits, the Elliott Lake uranium ores, provide evidence for an important theory, as explained by David Pearson of Laurentian University. This is uranium ore, and that's the sound that made a prospector very happy and might have made him very rich. The ore consists almost wholly of rounded quartz pebbles and quartz sand grains. Only one-tenth of a percent is the uranium ore mineral, granarite. Such rounded quartz pebbles and quartz sand grains are typical of beaches at the, the present day. But if you took such a mixture of quartz pebbles and grains and uranium ore mineral and placed it in a place where it could be washed by waves, you would find that although the pebbles would survive, the uranium ore mineral would be very quickly dissolved. And this, of course, raises the question of what's the difference between the present day and the past when this ore originated? The answer probably lies in the atmosphere. Today, oxygen is very important. We all breathe it. But in the past, there was very possibly no oxygen in the atmosphere, and therefore no oxygen dissolved in the seawater, which washed these pebbles and the uranium mineral around on the beach. And it seems that the rivers draining the hinterland, the granitic hinterland, were able to bring with them, as well as quartz pebbles, tiny grains of uraninite and granarite, the uranium ore minerals, and they were able to survive the washing around on the beach to become incorporated in this conglomerate and become the Elliott Lake and Denison uranium ores. If there was no oxygen in the Precambrian atmosphere, oxygen, which is essential for life on Earth today, the search for life in the Precambrian would seem hopeless. 
but clear evidence of life can be found in the Precambrian. Stromatolites, probably early algae, here built into limestone reefs, have been dated in the last billion years of Precambrian time. And evidence from South Africa shows that life may have existed as much as 3.2 billion years ago. Geologists have used all these pieces of fragmentary evidence to develop hypotheses about the beginnings of life on Earth. One theory suggests that the Earth developed an atmosphere of water vapor, ammonia, and hydrocarbons, such as methane. In this environment, which had no free oxygen, primitive one-celled organisms developed, living their short lives and disappearing. They lacked the hard shells or skeletons to be preserved as fossils. Some of these organisms probably produced oxygen, as do plankton in the sea today. Ultimately, other organisms probably became capable of using this oxygen. When this occurred, animal life began, as we know. However, if such an evolution took place, it is not known how or when. The rocks of the Precambrian provide only fragmentary clues. But because they are the only clues, these rocks are extremely important. With the development and use of radiometric dating techniques, surer correlations of rocks can be established. And a better understanding of the ages of Precambrian rocks will assist not only in commercial mining ventures, but in our grasp of the history and nature of our world. comes over to move us from southern to Hamanac and he'll throw in a care package. Oh, you got enough fresh meat for five days. The job of reconstructing the Precambrian isn't easy. The fossils are few and far between. Great gaps exist in the rock record itself. And all theories remain tentative until more pieces of the puzzle can be found. It's likely that the Precambrian will never yield its final secrets. But our quest for minerals will make detectives of science and industry long after the trail grows cold. 